Hey there, Possum Rob here. You guys blew up my Captain Kirk video like he blew up Landrew. Well, that's great because I love talking about old school Trek. But real quick, reach down there and hit that subscribe button if you don't mind. Once we get to a thousand subscribers, I swear I'll quit asking. It's just the YouTubes don't let me do all the things till I get to subscribers. So, you know, here we are. Anyway, one of the things that Gene Roddenberry had in his writer's guide for the original Star Trek was that there shouldn't be any, quote, petty military politics. He said, it comes off as unbelievable in our advanced century. Well, I guess it depends on what your personal definition of petty military politics is, but for my money, it seems like just about every flag officer and top-tier bureaucrat the crew encounter are the pettiest, jerkiest, and or most incompetent bucket of dingleberries in the entire universe. I don't know what they do to you when you get promoted beyond captain, but they either hit you with the neural neutralizer until you can't put your pants on right, or they light you up with a phaser set to asshole. So today, we're going to look at four examples of the most awful Commodores and bureaucrats in Star Trek. And, as always, we'll have some honorable mentions, too. So let's get started. Hey! So this first example is downright shocking at just how much of a useless idiot this guy is. To the point where I would list him as the actual antagonist of the story, even though it's supposed to be a man versus nature thing against an alien disease. Of course, I'm talking about Commodore Stocker, The Deadly Years. Now like before, I'm not going to get too much into summarizing these episodes. In the words of Inigo Montoya, Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. In this episode, the landing party contracts a disease that makes them age rapidly, and they have to race against our friend, the ticking clock, to find a cure or die of old age. Commodore Stocker, who is being ferried by the Enterprise to his new post as commander of Starbase 10, sees the aging crew, particularly Captain Kirk, losing their mental fitness for command, and decides this is the perfect time to grind all of the efforts to keep these people from dying to a halt and have a friggin' hearing to determine whether or not the mutant rapid aging disease is affecting people's brains. I mean, I know that Captain Kirk insists that it isn't, but since McCoy said that the disease makes you age about 30 years per day, it ain't gonna be a problem for more than a couple of days anyway, because at that point, they'll either have cured the thing or die in a poof of dust like Walter Donovan doing his Christopher Lloyd impression in The Last Crusade. I know I'm not the only one who sees it. Every time I watch this thing, I hear it in my head. Marty! Anyway, we make it to the end of the hearing, and the landing party has aged another 40 years by the end of it, and are thus mentally much more likely to find a cure to this thing, and despite Sulu being right there, wearing gold and everything, Stocker decides he's going to take command of the Enterprise. And the first thing this bag of butts does is plot a course to Starbase 10 that cuts right through the Romulan neutral zone. Now, I know this guy ain't command division, so maybe he didn't actually take the Kobayashi Maru test, but he went to the academy, so there's no way he didn't at least hear about the thing. Hey, Stocker, you hear what they're doing to the command track people? They make them take this test where they fly into the neutral zone and then Klingons blow them up. That's it. The test starts, neutral zone, and then they blow up. What kind of test is that? I mean, they got one where an axe murderer shows up and kills everybody too? You gonna eat that? But Napoleon Bonehead over here decides to do it for real and just stomps across the neutral zone. And when every Romulan in the place shows up to take issue with his choice of route, he's all... Trying to raise the wrong ones. I'm trying, Commodore. If I could talk to them, explain to them why we violated the neutral zone. The Romulans are notorious for not listening to explanations. A cured Kirk shows up and saves the day with a pretty rare callback to a previous episode, the Corbamite maneuver. In the end, everything works out, but how Stalker escapes getting his butt whooped by a very much young again Kirk is beyond me. Also, check out the weird little spring into action maneuver Kirk does when he gets out of the turbo lift. Don't know what's going on there. A side note here, 
I know it wasn't until next season, but wouldn't this have been a great first part of a two-parter where the Enterprise incident was the second part? It puts them in the Romulan neutral zone, and a bunch of cloaked ships just showed up, so it sets up the plot of the Enterprise incident. And Kirk has just suffered from a disease that affected his brain, so maybe the crew is still unsure if he's recovered all the way, so you still have the crazy Kirk angle. Like I said, the episodes are way too far apart for that to have been a possibility at the time, but it's fun to think about. All right, moving on. High Commission of Ferris, the Galileo 7. All right, this absolute bundle of joy comes out of the gate swinging. Not 30 seconds into the episode, the turbo lift doors open to reveal Lurch there, clearly intent on cheesing off even single-celled organisms with his little hip-cocked I-plan-to-be-a-problem stance. Plot of the episode is that while the Enterprise is on a schedule to rendezvous with a ship to transfer important medicine for a planet experiencing a plague, since they have some time before they're supposed to meet the ship, the Enterprise, which has standing orders to investigate quasars, decides to take some of that extra time to investigate a quasar that they happen to spot on the way there. They're pretty rare, so they gotta take every opportunity they get. So a shuttlecraft full of main cast members and some expendable guest stars goes out, something happens, and they get stuck on a planet full of giant murder monkeys, and the Enterprise has to go looking for them before the murder monkeys get them, or the time runs out and they have to go meet the ship. What? Yeah, your mother's a run-on sentence. Anyway, Kirk's not one to leave his crew behind, like some people I'm going to talk about in a minute, so he's understandably focused and dedicated to getting them back. But High Chancellor Jackass over here spends the entire time trying to get Kirk to cut him loose. I was opposed to this from the very beginning. We have two days to find them. Two days? In all that? Two days? What would you have me do? You don't really think you'll have any luck, do you? Captain. Yes, Commissioner. I don't relish the thought of abandoning your crewmen out there. However, I must remind you... I haven't forgotten, Commissioner. You're running out of time. I haven't forgotten that, Commissioner. 24 more hours, Captain. You have two hours and 43 minutes, Captain. I'm perfectly aware of how much time I have left. I am delighted, however, I shall continue to remind you. You do that. I get there's a plague happening, and this is an important delivery they're making, but the other ship ain't even gonna be there until way later, and this guy is actually wanting to let seven people get wiped out just so he can get to the rendezvous point and sit around doing nothing until the other ship shows up. And on top of that, he's wearing a jacket where his arms have little capes. What is that? What is that? That jacket might as well have D-Bag written on the back in 300 point comic sans. In the end, a Hail Mary by Spock gets the Enterprise's attention and they get saved. But by this time, High Commissioner Flappy Jacket has mysteriously disappeared. I imagine because he knows five people just beamed onto the ship that would like to discuss his obsession with getting to meetings early with him. Yeah, two of the guest stars ended up as Murder Monkey Pope. But what are you gonna do? Commodore Matthew Decker, the Doomsday Machine. So the Enterprise rolls up on the scene of some obvious destruction. A bunch of planets got Alderaan and they're trying to follow the trail. They come upon the USS Constellation looking worse than my Uncle Ted's El Camino. When they beam over, they find a crew gone and the captain, Matt Decker, at the auxiliary controls and unconscious. They get him awake and he tells them a huge monstrous ship destroyed the planets. When he tried to fight it, it came after him and beat the snot out of his ship. So he beamed the crew down to a planet to keep them safe. But it came back and smacked the constellation enough that it knocked out the transporters so he couldn't beam them back and wiped out the planet his crew was on. And he had to watch the whole thing happen. He's clearly traumatized and tortured by what he's just been through, and you really feel for the guy. They send him back to the Enterprise, and Scotty and Kirk hang around on the Constellation to see if they can get it up and running again. Doomsday Machine shows up and smacks the ships around enough that Kirk can't make it back to the Enterprise. It's around this time you stop feeling bad for Commodore Decker, because this guy takes advantage of Kirk's absence and assumes command of the Enterprise honking McCoy off to no end. Spock takes the opportunity to remind this chucklehead what happened to the last ship he commanded. Mr. Spock, I am officially notifying you that I am exercising my option under regulations as a Starfleet Commodore and that I am assuming command of the Enterprise. You have the right to do so, but I would advise against it. 
That thing must be destroyed. You tried to destroy it once before, Commodore. The result was a wrecked ship and a dead crew. Mr. Spock, that will be all. You have been relieved of command. Don't force me to relieve you of duty as well. You can't let him do this, Spock. Doctor, you are out of line. So are you, sir. What follows is a string of bad decisions, each one followed up by Spock pointing out just how bad the decision was. Now, I don't know if this is a deliberate strategy on Spock's part, but letting the guy take command and then pointing out how stupid each of his orders are seems like a great way to make sure this guy goes crazy as quickly as possible so McCoy can sweep in and declare him too nuts to command. Now, it doesn't get that far, though, because they managed to get Kirk on the phone, and he personally puts Spock in charge of the Enterprise. And Commodore Crazy Pants has to take a hike. Hell-bent on proving just how fit for command he is, he immediately, uh, unconvincingly whacks the guard escorting him to sickbay, then steals an unarmed shuttle and flies it straight into the ice cream cone from hell. Doesn't really accomplish much, but Spock notices that it does affect the ice cream cone's power levels, so they hatch a plot to do the same thing Decca did, only with the Constellation, and then blow the warp core once it's inside. It works, and the day is saved. And the best contribution the insane Commodore posse over there made was basically dying. All jokes aside, I do want to give a huge shout-out to William Wyndham's performance as Decker. He's able to portray broken and haunted, then complete jerkwad, then suicidally insane so well, and it all works with his character. It's definitely 60s acting, and today we'd probably call it a little overblown maybe, but as much as I don't like Matt Decker, I love this performance. Top notch. Ambassador Fox, A Taste of Armageddon. So, as usual, I've saved the best for last here. Though maybe best ain't the right word. This guy has all of the charm of High Commissioner Ferris with a heaping helping of Commodore Stocker's stunning level of competence. The Enterprise's mission is to establish diplomatic contact with Amini R7, and as the ship is approaching the planet, they send the Enterprise a warning not to approach. Right off the bat, Ambassador Fox goes full stalker and tells Kirk to ignore that and keep going. Doesn't wonder why they shouldn't approach, just goes lol no and approaches all off up on the planet. The captain and some people who aren't the Ambassador beam down and check things out since they were all weird about staying away. And they find out that this planet has been in a war with a neighboring planet for almost 500 years. And not only that, the bad guys just hit the capital city with an attack. Well, Spock doesn't sense anything on his tricorder. So Anon Seven, leader of the Amenian Council... These planets always seem to have councils. Have you noticed that? Anyway, he tells Kirk that the war is simulated using computers. And the casualties, which are determined by computer, are expected to go to suicide booths and kill themselves. Also, the Enterprise was quote-unquote destroyed in the attack, so the crew needs to come whack themselves if they wouldn't mind. Well, this sets Kirk off, and he does his thing trying to escape and indignantly change the cultural course of a whole planet for like the eighth time this year. And while Kirk's busy with that, Anon Seven keeps trying to trick the Enterprise into beaming literally everybody down, or lowering their shields so he can blow them up. Now these masterful ruses couldn't be more obvious if he was Lucy with a football. But Ambassador Charlie Brown over here keeps trying to get Scotty to let him try to kick it anyway. Finally, Fox manages to force his way down to the planet with some lackey we ain't never seen before, and he's immediately greeted with a stern invitation to check out the interior of the local Go Zap Yourself booth. As complete of a screw-up as this guy is, though, it's a miracle that the only person who ends up dying because of this nozzle is that lackey we saw earlier. And he just leaves him there, too. Oh, Horace died. That's inconvenient. I wanted some coffee. This guy... Well, Kirk basically tells Fox that he's only in charge of two things now, jack and sh**, and blows up the simulation computers so now the planets have to either wage war for real with destruction and all that, or they can negotiate for peace. And the stones on this guy, Ambassador Fox yourself over here, actually volunteers to mediate the negotiations. 
Now, we never returned to find out what happened, but with Fox taking care of things, I'd be very surprised if either of those planets are still there. Now, I'd be lying if I said that this was just a problem in the original series. I guess it became like a tradition to have these flag officers and diplomats just monumentally suck at their jobs, or just at being decent human beings. So here are some honorable mentions from the other series. First, you got Admiral Haftel, who apparently didn't watch the Next Generation episode Measure of a Man that established that Data is a life form and able to decide his own fate, because when Data creates a daughter for himself, this yutz elbows his way in and tries to take her away from him. Not only that, he's a massive jerk about it. Then you got Admiral Sati, who is called in to investigate an accident in engineering to see if it was sabotage. It don't take long before she goes full-blown Joe McCarthy, and all of a sudden Admiral Sfacin over here has accused everybody but the conference room ficus plant of being a Romulan spy. Speaking of McCarthy, you got Admiral Layton, who is so obsessed with rooting out changelings in the Federation, he stages an attack on the Federation, gets the president to declare martial law, basically launches a coup, and even gets one Federation ship to attack another one just to cover his own ass. I'll be here all night if I tried to list them all, but if you want some more, look up Admirals Pressman, Jameson, Kennelly, Cartwright, and most recently, Commodore O. But I have to be honest and give you one last example of a massive jerk admiral. As much as it pains me to do it, I am speaking of none other than Admiral James T. Kirk. Yep, we're going there. Remember when I said they smack you with the jerk hammer when you get promoted past captain? Well, our boy is not immune. In honor of Commodore Matthew Crazy Pants Decker, Admiral Kirk recommends his kid, Will Decker, for command of a starship. And not just any starship, the USS Enterprise. Captain Decker takes command right as the refit is starting. So when he takes command, the Enterprise looks like this. And by the time it's done, the Enterprise looks like this. So he's put in some serious work there. Well, the Epsilon 9 station gets sucked up into the Vija cloud, and it's heading toward Earth, so Kirk leaps on the opportunity to go pressure Admiral Nagura to give him back command of the Enterprise, which, yet again, is the only ship in the area, so he can handle this crisis. All due respect, sir, I hope this isn't some kind of Starfleet pep talk. I'm really too busy. I'm taking over the center seat, Will. You're what? I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. You'll stay on as executive officer temporary grade reduction to commander. Huh. Now who does that ironically remind me of? Mr. Spock, I am officially notifying you that I am exercising my option under regulations as a Starfleet Commodore and that I am assuming command of the Enterprise. Now on paper, it's smart to put Kirk in charge for this mission. In fact, we see a couple of times later in the movie that decisions Decker would have made would likely have caused the mission to fail. But Decker is, in my opinion, justifiably cheesed off about how all of this went down. Because Kirk is a major jerk to him about it. Even McCoy has to step in and call him out on it. Admiral, this is an almost totally new enterprise. You don't know her a tenth as well as I do. That's why you're staying aboard. Report to the bridge, Commander. Immediately. We have to replace Commander Sonak. I'd still like a Vulcan there, if possible. None available, Captain. In fact, there's no one who's fully rated on this design. You are, Mr. Decker. I'm afraid you're gonna have to double as science officer. You ram getting this command on Starfleet's throat. You've used this emergency to get the Enterprise back. And I intend to keep her, is that what you're saying? Yes. It's an obsession. An obsession that can blind you to far more immediate and critical responsibilities. Your reaction to Decker is an example, Jim. The things end up working out in the end, but they worked out in the end all them other times too, and those guys still made the list, so yeah. And it's worth noting he's a little jerky when he assumes command of the Enterprise again in Star Trek II as well. I know that none of you were expecting this. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to grow up a little bit sooner than you expect. What is it with these guys? All right, so this has been Possum Rob watching stuff with you. Come back later, we'll watch more stuff. You'll love it. If you like this look into the tragic jerkening of Commodore's admirals and whatnot, like that thumbs up button down there so as I know you dug it. 
And while you're down there, click on that subscribe button so as I can do more crap with the channel, huh? With Christmas coming up with all the travel and whatnot, I'm not sure when I'll be able to get another episode put out, so make sure you ring a ling that bell down there so as you don't miss it when it drops. Do you have a Commodore or a bureaucrat that you particularly don't like that I didn't include on the list? Or maybe you got one you'd like to submit as an exception to the rule. Well, let me know about it in the comments down there. I'd love to hear about it. So until next time, remember, possum friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, all right? Later. And happy holidays. Hey!